I'm very glad to speak with you, Josef, uh, would like, and I would like to present you to our Russian auditorium. Please uh, tell us uh, uh, your age, your education, what, what is your profession, maybe about your family, a few words. So. Okay. I'm 62 years old. I was born in America as a secular, non-religious Jew and uh, Austro-Poland before the First and Second World War. Uh, I had a pretty good education. I also, by 18, I already understood that I would not become enlightened by smoking drugs. Uh -huh. And then I studied filmmaking to film alternative cultural solutions because I understood by the age of 22 that the uh, systems in place, whether they be political or scientific or social, were failing. Mm. So, uh, when I started working on alternative cultural solutions, photographing them, filming them, uh, I then also found uh, Transcendental Meditation from India. Uh -huh. and I, uh, I became in the top of that movement. In have you been in India and somewhere in... Yes, I have. Yes, I have. But uh, I became familiar... I also studied a lot of Eastern because in the university, the first university I graduated from, everybody did transcendental meditation. So we got a background in that area too. So I have a pretty thorough knowledge of Ayurvedic uh, medical approach and Sanskrit and, and the, their worldview and their, the different forms of meditation, which are primarily three. There's uh, transcendental methods, there's concentrative methods, concentration. I got secondary degree. Uh, I have degrees actually in philosophy, some psychophysiology, and, um, and um, an education degree, secondary, that's a master's. And then I also returned to my Jewish religious roots and moved to Israel all by the age of 26 to 30. Okay. So then from there, I, I actually studied about 20 years in an Orthodox rabbinical seminary which at the same time in the early 90s, I was already developing from the best therapists in the world, learning different tools. I focused almost entirely on physiologically based tools. Uh -huh. Because like in, in meditation and in psychophysiology, we used to measure the brain waves and we used to see how, what changes in the blood chemistry, what changes in the brain waves, the main point, which is actually the discovery statement of EFT, emotional freedom technique, is uh, whenever a person has a aroused state, whether it be a, a positive or a negative, but it's actually is an addition to Gary Craig. Gary Craig, the founder of EFT, is my teacher, my personal teacher. But wow. he used to say a negative thought or feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not true, actually. You have to add to that. Whether it's negative or positive, for instance, in depression, there are two types of depression. There's just going down, which uh -huh. is called manic. Uh, it's called, uh, well, it has different names. But when you call it bipolar manic depression, that's the type of depression that goes up and down. And actually, they get in more dangerous uh, activity and behavior when they go up because they think they're Superman, you know, and they tend uh -huh. to go up. Okay, so, is something like that. Do they uh, have. Uh, yeah, so, so the point is, is that whether your thought or feeling is highly aroused in the negative or the positive, you always have a state-linked reality. A state-linked reality means your mind-body is also in a state of disruption. And it's simple. I'm angry! When a person says that, you see what happens. The fists go up, or there's tension here, or there's tension in the cheekbone. Whether it's between the eyes, right? But there's a state thing reality where there's this disruption, an energy disruption in your energetic mind body system. So the difference in energy psychology from all forms of psychology is that we consider that primary, not secondary. Uh -huh. Now, yes. uh -huh. cognitive psychology bullshit from above and below and the side about what's going on and what's your history and when did it start and all this crap, you know, which there's a certain value to it. The more cognitive psychology you know, the better therapist you will be unless you're stuck in that box. 
looking at reality from that framework. Because in fact, unless you first teach a person to take on their own shoulders responsibility for the disruptions that are occurring, whether they be negative or positive in their own nervous system, when they get angry or frustrated or depressed or super happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're never going to really make lasting change and get unstuck from your self-sabotaging behavior. And all the forms of physiological psychology, which actually primary relate to the disruption before the content. In other words, there's form and there's content. Form means how is it affecting me as a person formally? Am I acting like a nut? Hey, I'm angry. <laughs> Or am I, you know, okay, there's great things happening, so there's, you know, shit hitting the fan, as they say, English, bad things are happening. But at least I'm going to stay composed. My level of being is going to be more together. Why? Because if I control my state, then I'm, uh, I'm not going to be a robot. For sure, I'm going to learn how to feel everything fully. But I want in my full feeling to maintain a perspective on reality that it's balanced. So that if the high or the low is going to get me stuck in thinking, speaking, or behaving in a way that's not productive for me, whether that be relationships or business or just my, my mental um, focus, whatever it is, or with kids, behavior, anger, communication, it won't help me. So that's why I gravitate towards these fields. Now, um, to go forward in what you asked me about, uh, Pavel, about uh, my history. Um, uh, while I was developing my rabbinical studies uh, and Kabbalistic studies, which go hand in hand with everything I do, because the spiritual di dimension of Judaism, like the spiritual dimension of any religion or any spirituality, because some people are quite spiritual without religion, right? has to do with the inner dimension of human personality. And at the same time as developing your ability to be consistent and be clear and be emotionally clear, um, there's an inner dimension that gives us meaning in our lives that goes beyond even the emotional, spiritual and emotional and intellectual, and that I also developed. So I, I got rabbinical ordination, as they say, but I also went on to connect myself to a person who today is 80, who is one of the leading uh, elders in the Kabbalistic world. And I actually live in the old city, the old ancient walled city of Jerusalem, where I'm speaking from now, uh, around the corner from this man. And I pray with him every day at the Holy Insight of Judaism, which is the Western Wall. And I learn from him. And I actually integrate. A lot of the things that he teaches me about human personality and how to change human personality to good, which doesn't just apply to Jews or Kabbalists or it's, it's a human thing. It has to do with all of us creatures on this planet who are faced with a lot of the very same challenges of intellect, emotion, thought, speech, behavior. So um, this man has written about 50 Kabbalistic books. He gave me permission in the last two years to take uh, a 16th century classic that also goes right in line with my main theme of work in the last 20 years and translate his commentary and the original work according to his commentary. What, from what age was it? 16th age or 16th? Right, no, the, the, the Kabbalistic work was written in Safed or Spot Israel, northern Israel, where I also live. Um, it was written in 15, around 15... Uh, 50, something like that. And it was written by the Ramak, Rav Moshe Cordovero, who's one of the main figures in Kabbalah. And um, it's called the Palm Tree of Deborah. The interesting thing about it is, is that like what I presented in London in 2011 at the AMT uh, Energy Psychology Conference, I was one of the presenters there. Um, I took Gary Craig, the founder of EFT, um, main program for self-development that he developed called the personal peace procedure. Yeah, inner peace. It means yeah, harmony with yourself, accepting your, your position in life and your, your you know inner peace. Right. So Gary Craig created this 
program back in the 90s or the early 2000s that he said, you know, the way to make EFT a, um, an individual consciousness tool, evolutionary tool, as well as a social tool, is to start with yourself. Because you can't really change the world, you have to change yourself and be a model. The point is to model what you want to teach, not to tell people what you want to tell them. There's a great thing I saw on the internet, I have a lot of kids, I have like eight kids, six boys and two girls. My oldest is 35, my youngest is three-year-old twins, right? And the twins, yes. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, I'm taking care of them now because my wife was a filmmaker and a, a, a photographer, she's in New York for a few days, she's coming back now. I've been taking care of them for two weeks. I learned more from my three-year-olds at my age than anybody. But the point is that when you have kids, there's a, a thing I saw on the internet that really sums it up. There's a picture of a father holding the hand of a little kid, and they're jumping uh, from one place to another, holding hands. And the caption is, he's going to remember what you do, not what you say. Mm -hmm. And holding hands together and jumping is something, you know, you're living life together as a father and a kid and enjoying it. And, you know, the kid feels you love him and the kid feels you're teaching him something and that he's okay. Even, even if he falls, he's going to get up and he can get up by himself. And these are all lessons that we want to teach in our training as well. So um, the reason I brought that up was simply to say that um, this book that I've been translating is um, giving a human being, well, you know, it really doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. I'll say it from my mom, because I believe in God, okay? But um, if you believe in a spiritual, that there is a spiritual source, whatever you call it, okay? So obviously, there's a reason for it. The reason is to teach us how to make ourselves the best we can and to be good human beings. Whatever that means, right? Mm -hmm. So, with that assumption, okay, which I grant you assumption, some people will say that's bullshit also, fine, okay. But, with that assumption, so, what is this thing God? What is this thing spirituality? How do I know it's good? How do I know what it wants from me? How do I know that that's what I'm supposed to do as a human being, right? So, this particular Kabbalist in 1550, he wrote a book saying, well, Judaism says, the only thing we know is that we are created in God's image. So it must be we have to study what's God's image. So Gary Craig, back to emotional freedom technique, created this thing at the beginning of EFT called the personal peace procedure. What it was was he said, you know what? You're going to think this stuff of tapping and saying words is too simple. You're going to quit, which most people do. because you have no human beings basically are very inconsistent. The only thing they're going to return to is something that has an immediate payoff that they can feel, like food, sex, going to the bathroom. These are three things that most people need, right? And they pay off right away. You know, you have to go to the bathroom and you don't, you're, you know, you're, you're in trouble. Fine. So, um, Gary said to make personal peace. Start to remember what memories are coming up in your computer. I call the mind body like a computer system, right? So if a memory is coming up, whether it's intellectual, emotional, or spiritual, and as we said before, it's always in your body, because whenever you have a negative or, or positive charge, you feel it in your body somewhere, and it's bothering you somehow. It could be positive, it could be negative, but it's, it's there, right? It's like when you see somebody you love, you have very good feelings. If you want to hug that person, that's in your body, right? If you ignore that, you're not going to be very successful. Okay? So, um, start writing down all of these experiences from the beginning of your life that you don't forget, but they keep coming up. Because Gary went with the assumption that any memory that continues to come up, it must be somehow still in your energy system and important for you. There must be some negotiation that still needs to be done. And there must be some payoff, some lesson to learn from it that will make you a better person. So he devised the personal peace procedure, get all those events, and start to work them through using this cool emotional freedom technique. Fine. So 
this 1550s Kabbalist, um, what he did was he made these categories, much like in philosophy you have Immanuel Kant, made the Kantian categories of the mind, right? So this is a spiritual divine source telling you 13 ways that God is merciful or compassionate and how you can practice that in your own thought, speech, and behavior to make yourself more compassionate and merciful. Fine. So those two things fit together. You may not, on the surface, feel it immediately how Gary's personal piece procedure and that fit together, but they do, and that's the core of what I'm working on now in terms of a future uh, production that I'm going to do and course that actually integrates that stuff into practical exercise. Okay? And I've done some of that. In 2011, I already presented in, in London to an audience that was almost no no Jews, certainly no religious Jews, and nobody was alienated. Everybody benefited, and people really enjoyed it and found practical things they could do. So it has nothing to do, per se, with religion or you accepting my spiritual belief system. It's why when I train people, I try and keep that out of the training environment unless people need to bring it in. Why? Because the training environment is a room of diverse people, and everybody has their opinion. And I'm trying to convey practical techniques that whoever you are, whatever you believe, whatever political party, whatever gender issues, whatever religious issues, whatever your opinions are, if you don't get alienated or in conflict with me because I represent something you don't like, then you can get from me some valuable tools like jewels that you can start to move ahead and make yourself better in any area you want, whether it be your opinions or your feelings or your spiritual connections, whatever. So in the end, we have a big problem in our society today, and wherever it is, whether it's Russia or America or Israel, anywhere, and that is that people have kind of learned not to think, and they get triggered very easily about emotional and political and religious and all kinds of differences, and then they start to treat other people badly which is not going to help us as human beings. So that's where I'm coming from. That's what I want to train. So um, to, to further answer your question, my passion and my profession since at least the mid-90s, when I first uh, you know, got seriously into EE brainwave neurofeedback and Gary Craig and EFT, and later even the, the predecessor to EFT, which was uh, thought field therapy, Roger Callahan, and his wife, who was my personal teacher also, and then BSFF, Larry Nim, who's my personal teacher, also the founder. All the founders I went to learn by. Okay, and NLP. I'm a I'm a trainer. Do you in know? NLP. Do you know? Do you know Larry Nims? Yes, Larry and I. I really like him. He's a wonderful human being. And and also Alfred Alfred Heath, who's running. Uh, and there's another guy also in uh, another guy who lives in in Borden. All three of them are good friends of mine, but Alfred Heath is pretty much running the show for Larry today. He's a really great guy, and, uh, and they're teaching something that's very valuable. The point is, is that I don't want to compare and contrast. What I do want to do is anybody who's in a training environment, when they come to a training, they use what they've learned as a bridge to understand what they're learning now. But if they keep comparing it, they're not going to learn what I'm teaching. Why? Because the way that a good practitioner or even a person who just comes to help himself is going to succeed is by taking each particular tool as it is by itself, learning it very well, and practicing it till you get it and it works for you. Then you also sort out what works best for me. It may be what works best for me is not going to be because what works best for you, right? But unless you come to my training to learn what I'm offering, and I'm not mixing and matching it with other stuff. I give you a pure entity. You're never going to know if this tool is what it is and if it's really, really good yes. for you. Yes, now, now I, just, I just would like to remind people and tell that we invite in Yosef to Moscow to make training with EFT, basic level, basic study of EFT. Many people uh, ask us, do we make some studies? And now we invite you. And also we would like to invite you to teach us magic screen printing. Could you sell few, say a few words about uh, EFT, basic level, what is it, and your matrix reprinting? Right. Thank you very much for the question. That's a good one. 
Um, as humans, what have we been talking about in the last 10, 15 minutes is self-enablement, self, a skill set that even a six-year-old can learn so that if he gets upset or anxious or fearful or just stressed out or can't think straight, he can do something to himself to begin to make himself come back to the room, come back to the body, be clear, and get something done, okay? And that doesn't matter what you're trying to do. That will help everybody. So um, that's one aspect. Uh, and that's what we talked about. You have disrupted state realities. You want to be able to regain control and own your own state so that you know how to progress, you know, whatever whatever's you need to accomplish or is bothering you or you're stuck in time. Then there's uh, a second thing about spiritual tools. Now, again, whatever you believe in is not important, but if you could access realities that are non-linear, that are, um, for instance, surrogate work, which is something we teach in EFT and in, in Matrix Reimprinting, where um, I'll tell you one story now, for instance. Um, I was in a training where I was training practitioners and there was a guy who was about my age. I was in my 40s or 50s then, early 50s or late 40s. And both of us had teenage sons, two of them each, that were not then communicating with us. They were upset with us or whatever, you know. So um, we took an experiment one day. And we decided we're going to do surrogate work. We're both going to just take these two sons and we're going to start communicating with them using EFT on ourselves as if we are either sending them messages or working on them through our own body. You can do it either way. It doesn't really matter. However, there are some rules. The basic rule is you can't really mess with a person's belief system or try and influence him to force him to be a way that he's not. It's like, you know, any teenager, if you tell them, do this, he'll do the other, right? Because that's teenage people, right? So um, it's not really fair because, you know, I, I like to say it this way. You can, in, a, in English, they have an expression. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I say yes. it a little differently. You can take a horse to water, you can make him drink, but get ready for a chick in the worst place. Uh, you mean you will be kicked in the worst place? Right. The, that horse, when you force him to drink, he's going to turn around and kick you in a place that you're, you're going to be hurting. Okay? Uh. So, that's a teenager, or that's any human being. Anytime you force a human being to believe, think, do something that they really don't want to do, they may do it because they love you or because you have a gun or because, you know, who knows, many reasons. There are many weak personalities out there. But they're not going to like you. And in the end, it's never going to stick because they didn't own it themselves. They didn't come to it from their own free will. Okay? So, um, I mean, kids, you teach. But even then, you, you're teaching them to become adults so they can make up their mind for themselves. And in the, in, the, in the beginning, you're kind of protecting them from themselves because they'll make stupid choices because they don't have developed minds, you know. Okay, whatever. But the point is, is that... Um, Okay, I saw, so what we did was, in surrogate work, you can give another person basic human needs that everyone would agree with without asking their permission. For instance, a person may be self-destructive, but if he were thinking clearly, he would want to have more self-esteem. Uh, for instance, if a person is self-destructive, they may not be protecting themselves or acting in ways to protect themselves. But if they would think straight, they would want to be protected from being damaged, right? Anything like that that doesn't have a moral issue or a, or a, a critical issue, or, you can do surrogately without asking the other person. Because you're giving them something that we can assess objectively a human being would want, especially from someone that is supposed to love them or care about them. It's fine. So what we did was we sent our kids these messages and these things that we thought would help them. 
that they could also feel that we cared about them. We also sent them back. Okay. Now they might not want that now because they might be upset with their with their parents or whatever. But ideally, a kid does want his parents to feel to care about him. Okay. Even if he has a lot of complaints. What happened was with within one day, all four of these children contacted their parents positively. And they didn't know why, and they didn't know what, but they felt the work that we had done. And they felt from their perspective to reach out to us. Now imagine how that can change reality. Now we know ever since The Secret and other films in the last 20 years, that NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which I've learned at trainer level, uh, makes a big deal out of the idea that what you put out is what you're going to get back. They call it the attraction principle. And my concept of becoming a better human being in reality is, is that, yeah, I want to win when I set my sights on something, but I don't want to win by tricking people or playing with their systems and messing with what I know is like, you know, because I know how to push their buttons the right way or how to make somebody buy my product only because I know how to push their buttons and it may not be the best thing for their business interest to buy it from me right now. These are all moral, ethical considerations. The energy psychology community, by and large, I love the people in the community. And I may disagree with them on many, many issues, content issues, not form issues, like, you know, politics, ideology, religion, all that stuff. But as people, generally, the people attracted to our community are real therapists. They really are not in it just to get an ego kit. They're trying to become better human beings and make other pe help other people become more self-empowered and better human beings. Let me answer your question. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Right. About your training, just about your training, what right. you're going to do, what so, you teach people and matrix reprinting, why matrix reprinting is like enhancing of uh, if, of your EFT work. And right. Okay. So the basic EFT training is a standard training. I have an advantage that I've trained at least 700 people in the training. And I've done it in different languages, and I've done it in many, many formats in many cities in Israel and internationally. I taught in Prague, but I've never taught in Russia yet. And um, I understand very well from since, you know, 90s I've been in it. So I understand very well the same questions, the same stepping stone issues come up in every training. And I know how to explain people through without wasting the time of the audience of the people that aren't stuck on that issue. I'll give you an example because it makes sense if you're not, if you're clear and not vague. Um, cognitive psychologists or people that got used to believing in words have a very difficult time with the verbal formula of EFT. First of all, it sounds very simplistic. Secondly, um, because of modern psychology, many people don't like that you, the first half of the statement is declaring the problem. People would rather talk about the solution. So the simplest way to explain that to them is it's a formal thing that all you're doing is when you take a blood test or when you take an x-ray, you're getting information. Where in the system is there a glitch? Is there a problem? Is there a chemical imbalance? So by stating what you're stuck on, you're actually recreating that disruptive state in your system while you're working on it. And the procedure you're working on it is like a medical procedure in the sense that just like acupressure and acupuncture mediates, calms, soothes, orders the system, you're introducing the order while the disorder is there at the same time. And if you don't have the disorder there, you can't really test whether you're actually having an impact on changing the disorder. And EFT is the only tool now that's proven to reduce blood cortisol levels by up to 24% within 30 minutes of self-application. Now, blood cortisol levels is thought to be the, the best indicator of stress anxiety in your system. So if you, you, mean minim, it, you mean minimum 30%? Minimum may, 30 or more. Within the, within the first 30 minutes after you apply it on yourself, it goes down almost a quarter of what, uh, at least a quarter less than what it was, almost 25% less than it was. Yes, so yes. 
you can take a six-year-old kid in a classroom who's acting out, where he just can't focus his brain, and you can help him to know that when he's upset or anxious or can't stay still or can't focus, that he can do a, a, something that you teach him like a game that will make him feel better and clearer. You've changed the whole reality of the, of the rest of the classroom too because he could probably be disrupting all the other kids in the room too, right? And talk about communication without anger and, and letting kids get along better. It's great, okay? So that's why I like EFT. What I'm going to teach you in a basic training is the same basic formula that everybody teaches, except what I like to do is maximize the amount of interactive practice because practice is the way you get it not by talking about it you have to do exercises so i also like to be creative in devising the exercise now you can use it for simple straight things like pain relief which is very important or craving to stop craving or you can use it for making a business plan or something intellectual that you have to be clear on and you have to know what you need and what you don't need or you can use it for emotional issues, like which is really good for stress, anxiety, uh, fear, and things like this. Okay, but you're going to have exercises that teach you how to apply it to all different areas of reality and and working with your nervous system, your thoughts. Okay, now that, matrix, matrix is a whole different world. The, the difference is like this: um, EFT is the basic tool that everybody needs, but they need it in a way where they won't just go to a course like, you know, courses in my, I've been through so many courses that I know that most people that go to courses, including myself sometimes, see it as a high. It's like a, a community experience. It's like, you know, you're, you're enjoying life together. You're learning something. So what I learned over the years is that in a course, before you leave, you have to get people to make a commitment to do some kind of um, group support and swapping. Swapping means um, that once a week, at least, you're going to at least go on Skype with your partner. And one week you treat your partner, next week your partner treats you. And you keep doing it. Because whether you're a practitioner or whether you're just a person who uses it for yourself, this is going to make it part of your body, part of your mind, part of your life, and you're going to realize the value. I can tell you that for the last two years, I have a female non-Jewish colleague in the UK that we do swapping every single week, and we have made unbelievable, not just major, major advances in our own personal lives, but we are developing new material in matrix reimprinting and EFT from our helping each other. And the perspective that it gives us when we come to clients is a whole new world. Because unless you yourself are in therapy, quote unquote, progressing in your life, dealing with your own issues, it's a little bit um, presumptuous to keep helping other people when you're not actually um, aggressively dealing with your own issues from day to day, because there's nobody in the whole world that doesn't have constant issues. That's life. Okay? So, matrix is another level. How is it another level? Um, when I first learned matrix from Carl, who is uh, one of the EFT masters, and uh, we were friends since 2007 in Manchester in the masters, I was... Gary Craig's personal guest at the, at the European Masters. I was not on the course, I was a personal guest. So um, Carl and I met then in England, and um, we've been friends all along. And he had actually a spiritual experience in Australia that led to the creation of Matrix through a client of his. Now, I'll make it simple, but it really needs more conversation. But Basically, he discovered something that he calls an echo, which is an, uh, an anagram standing for energy consciousness hologram. In NLP language, no linguistic programming language, is very simple. We have a timeline. In other words, Pavel started in his mother's womb. And then he came into the world, then he went through all these experiences until he gets to be his current age. Which I'm, you're quite, I'm, I imagine I have children your age. My oldest child's 35. But okay, so 
you have this whole timeline of experiences. And as they say, normally zero to six are the formative experiences where things happen that you may not even be aware of. Now, we know today that things also happen before you come into this world. In fact, many people believe, and the Jewish people believe, in reincarnation as well. So you could have been in different bodies, or you could at least have memories from different family members or different generations. Who knows what? Now, you could say you don't believe in some stuff, fine. But it will be hard to explain it, especially, as you mentioned, in the healing system, because my friend who practices that, he recovers these memories also. And we see that people, um, there's major research now from um, Rachel Yehuda on the Holocaust uh, family that it seems that traumas come down on the egg and the sperm and go uh, to other generations so that People are experiencing traumas from previous generations that they had absolutely no contact with, and they didn't even hear the stories of these traumas. Okay, yes. so if that's the case, you have this timeline of all these events. Some of those events, like the personal peace procedure, come up as disruptions in your energy system, and they even sometimes make you stuck or prevent you from things, and you don't even know why. Why are you suddenly frightened of something? Well, I can tell you in my life, I never learned how to swim in the sea well because I had a sea trauma when I was about three, four, five years old. I remember I was chasing a beach ball, a big colored beach ball into the ocean, and I just kept going like that. I walked into the sea and I had to be rescued. Since then, I had that fear. Irrational, based on reality, because it really happened. But when you get older, it's kind of irrational. You know, it's really helpful to, and I can swim. It's just when I get in seawater, so I, I, it's hard for me to, you know, turn my head and breathe and whatever, you know. So yeah. these are the Gary kind of Craig, things. Yes, Gary Craig is specialist on water issues and this story about right. water and afraid of water. That's <laughs> right. So, so that's the way people work. It's like computer glitches, okay? And when I treated the, the Malo uh, terror massacre victims, which is the first major event in modern history of, uh, you know, 100 children were seized by terrorists for 13 hours in a small place, and they were, it was barbaric, and in the end, uh, when the army tried to storm the place, uh, they didn't get in, and the terrorists blew them up, and they, and they killed 22, and they injured almost everybody of 100 kids, all 14 to 70 year olds, and I treated them 38 years later, and um, I, I took an international team of seven experts, including Alina Frank and Karen Davidson, friends of mine who are big people in nature today, and we had a big producer, and we filmed it for nine days. And we saw unbelievable things with nature stream printing. So I'm going to tell you why in a minute, okay? Why nature, okay? But what we saw was that these people had 38-year-old traumas. We interviewed their children and even, in some cases, grandchildren, and saw that traumas passed down. Like, for instance, the parents, the, the grandparents, wouldn't let the grandchildren go on school outings because this happened when they were on a school outing. And they were afraid, right? So, but we saw some of the traumas, which you can explain it with cognitive psychology all you want. Why is no reason to be uh, afraid? I have, a, I have a question about yeah. surrogate sapping. So, when you were working with these uh, people with trauma, what happened with their kids that uh, just have had influence, then influence uh, finished? Did they change? Did they uh, let go of their fear because you work with their parents and grandparents? Right. Okay, interesting question. And, it, you know, your questions are great. The way I'll answer that, actually, is it's a process. You do need to introduce cognitive stuff. What you need to do is you need to first free the grandparent or the parent of the fear that the same thing is going to happen to their child if they let their child go on an outing. Then you have to deal with the child or the, gra or the grandchild because there's, there's a certain piece there that's just letting go. And there's another piece that's um, kind of connecting because the bonds, it has to be established that there's no control over reality because it could happen that, that one of those children will be, you know, re-victimized in a similar way. But we don't want to live our lives preventing life because of a fear that happened to somebody else in the family. So there's, there's parts to the process. But the main idea, which explains to you how matrix is different from EFT, is why matrix works and how. What happens is, is that 
it's very hard to access your timeline in a way that, first of all, does not re-traumatize you, and secondly, um, can actually free you of the flashback or the irrational fear or the way that that trauma is today triggered and impacting on your life negatively. So the way that EFT actually not only is ineffective in certain cases, but in certain cases it can even um, it can even make the problem worse. I don't want to go into that now, but I'll explain that on a course, okay? However, matrix matrix on all three aspects is wonderful. What are the three aspects? When you go to help a person, you have the therapist, you have the client, and then in this case, you have the client at the time of the trauma, which is a timeline client. It's an earlier client. It could be a few months earlier, but usually it's like years earlier. Okay? So, when you're doing that verbally, you have severe limitations. EFT as a tool for tapping can calm you down in relationship to the material that's coming up, but it still doesn't get directly into the space, the energetic space of the little child or the therapists are often more screwed up than their clients. And the reason is, is because we get an ego kick from being a caretaker and helping another person. So that creates a God complex of I think that I'm doing the work and I'm fixing you and I'm great and I'm the one who's helping you. Bullshit. A person helps himself. Maybe he gets God's help or spiritual help to help himself, but a person helps himself. And that's the whole model of energy psychology. If you can say one thing about energy psychology that's different besides the idea that there's this discovery state that there's a disruption in the energy system and that the, the formal disruption is more important than the content of what you're talking about, the second thing you would say is, is that um, in the work of energy psychology, uh, a person needs to free himself from all of the ego restraints in order to enable the client to do his work. Because if the client doesn't cure himself, quote unquote, or helps himself, it won't last and it won't be real. So how do you do that? Okay. Most therapy occurs that I'm kind of pushing your buttons, Pavel, and I'm leading you and I'm fixing you as if it were. God complex. No, not matrix. The way matrix works is I become purely an external facilitator. The therapist has to be observant, much like an EEG machine observes the brain activity and records it. So what I'm doing is I'm watching you. I'm setting up a dynamic so that Pavel, who whatever age you are, say you're 35, Pavel is 35, is sitting here, and Pavel's client is going to be the six-year-old Pavel. And maybe he was even called something else like Paul then. Who knows? Because many people have nicknames when they're older, they're different names. So let's say you were little Pauly, and now you're big Pavel, okay? So you are I. In other words, Pavel is the I. And to him, the client, Pauly, is him or you, second person, right? So I, as the therapist, am the third person. I'm standing outside. My job is watch Pavel and explain to Pavel, you, Pavel, have to let go of the process. Your job is to be the therapist for little Pauly in his trauma. In order for you to do that, the hard part is, you are him, he's you. You're actually the same person. You're just different places on the timeline. But if you don't keep that separation of I and him, you're going to fall into his trauma and have all the same feelings and experiences and emotions and thoughts and freakouts that he's having when he goes back there. 
you aren't going to be worth much to help him because you're going to be, hopefully, you're supposed to hold his hand and help him, literally hold his hand because you're going to also do tapping energy on him, but you're the one who's there to keep him calm and pull him through, and you're just falling into the trouble like him because it's you and him, you're really the same person, so you're worth nothing. You're not going to be helpful. So your job is to say I, your 35-year-old self, watching Polly and getting his permission and his instructions. He's going to lead you. And you're going to ask him permission to, you know what, Polly? I think if we did this together, and he's called your echo, your energy consciousness hologram. If we did this together, I think we'd both benefit. We could go back there. Maybe we could rewrite it. Because, the, again, the mottos of, of, of matrix reprinting are, it has two mottos, basically. Transform your past, rewrite your future. Or transform your beliefs and transform your life. So what you're doing is you're going back there to rewrite anything that's a glitch, that doesn't work for you, that's sending you messages and signals on the level of the disruption of your energy system that make you frightened now or make you do the wrong thing and make you mess up, right? So you have to be the therapist for yourself. I have to observe and watch when are you falling into his stuff. And uh, then uh, I say, wait, wait a second, Pablo. Is that you experiencing that or is that Pauly? Oh, oh, no, actually I am. Okay, let's tap on that. Let's work that through in Pavel and get away from Pauly now. Because you're not useful for him when you're your own stuff. So then you come back to balance using EFT. Then you go back into the matrix where you're the therapist for Holly. And what happens is you rewrite it. Now, I also made two very significant innovations in Matrix that some people are using also, but it makes it another whole level also. But the basic idea is, as a therapist, I have fixed my God complex, and I am not getting my ego in the way. Why? Because I'm not the therapist anymore. My job is only to manage that you stick to the rules and you stay out of Holly's stuff. Uh, and your job also avoids the ego. Why? Because if you be helping Paulie, Paulie's going to tell you what to do. You're not going to tell him what to do. Uh, so you're going to follow his instructions, and he's going to, and you're going to have a communication at different points on your timeline. And then the, the innovations I made are actually going to merge your timeline in both directions at the end, and that's beautiful. Because actually, what I added. Oftentimes, in the end of the treatment, you will learn more from Polly than you gave him help about uh, you today. Okay. So anyway, that's a summary. But let's go back outside and examine it from a, uh, a different clinical perspective. The advantage to Matrix is is not just that we get around to everybody's ego, but we get into extremely difficult traumas like rape and terrorism, and it's not painful. It's somewhat very disassociated, and for you people that may not know what that means, association means you're seeing it through your own eyes and you're living it, you're reliving it. It's very re-traumatizing if you do PTSD work that way, post-traumatic stress in the room. So this is disassociated. You're watching it like on a movie, but yet, it really does rewrite the actual experience in a way that you can actually change the core of all the signals and damage that come from it. And I can give you some examples. I can give you some stories. Um, and I can tell you that, again, I want to go back outside and say, today in my life, um, I don't need to work. I only work because I love people. I love to train skills. Because I think that if we're going to make humanity better, because whether you believe in God or not is not the issue. The point is, is that we are screwing up our planet. Everybody can agree to that. We do not have our act together as human beings. The computer has a lot of glitches that result in violence, theft, uh, sexual violence, screwing up little kids, racial issues, everything. Right? And there are a lot of people that just have bad intent. They, they, their whole life is bad intent. They want to hurt other people. They want to do bad things to people. Right? So 
What we need is tools. And now you can start back to the interview, okay? We need tools that make us better human beings. We do have to get our act together because the, the, the situation is not very good. What I teach is EFT as a basic tool. And the reason I like matrix reimprinting is because it goes where nothing I have learned yet can go. There may be other things. Maybe Hellinger goes there. Maybe sometimes BSFS goes there. Maybe other things go there. But for me, I have personally seen and can tell you a number of stories where matrix reimprinting takes traumas that people thought they would never, ever release themselves of, and it would keep screwing up their life and getting them stuck for the rest of their life, and they let go, and they moved on. So he can do better what he does. However, I add on that, my end goal is that people should become more compassionate, more merciful, better human beings. I can't take responsibility for that. So if a person wants to have now and then, or they don't have an ethical system, there's nothing you can do. You can only offer what you offer. Okay? So, um, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, you answered a few questions. You started telling about uh, you work with people who were victims of terrorists. Um, what about uh, your program in Tsaft and what did you do there? Like, I would just like to show the potential of EFT being a governmental program. Okay, uh, like great. that happened in Tsaft and what did you do there? What, what was the program? Okay. I'll tell you a couple fronts that I'm busy on. My most favorite front would be the educational system. Why? Because we see that we need to help very young people from an early age develop interpersonal communication skills, uh, nonviolent communication skills, thinking skills. And that is getting worse rather than better, unfortunately. So um, I have, in the last year, focused on giving advanced training to primarily a women's group in the old city of Jerusalem who are advanced educators, advanced guidance counselors who manage other guidance counselors, advanced teachers who train and manage other teachers. And I had hoped that I would get directly in the school system. Now, in thought, what? How did this whole thing start? Um, I was convinced from the beginning of my career that even though I was not born independently wealthy, I did not want to get caught in the um, competition of therapeutic practitioners realm. Because if you're busy competing to sell the most or get the best product, um, you're not really completely interested in becoming great at what you're doing, you're interested in making money and becoming known, okay? So what I decided to do was pick an issue and focus on creating a nonprofit. The first thing I specialized in was back in the early 90s was in attention deficit disorder, ADD kids, with um, issues of attention and learning. And that's why I started with uh, neurofeedback and EFT. And I became fairly expert in that. And I used to work with the psychiatrists who were prescribing the Ritalin and all this other stuff. But uh, from there, I became very deeply moved by the uh, terrorism in Israel. In 2004, the main modus operandi of terrorism was to blow up public city buses. You can imagine if a bus gets blown up, there are hundreds of people affected. Because it's not just the people on the bus, it's their family members, their community members, everything, and people lose limbs and, you know, horrible burns and, and, and uh, you know, they load these, these, these bombs with shrapnel and, and rat poison. It's a terrible thing. So I was providing support, free support for the people and the families um, using these tools. And I created a nonprofit called Israel Trauma Care. Fine. So, um, I did a fair amount of work with terror victims. Then I moved to northern Israel, and I started helping people there. And I, I guess, you know, who knows how it happened, but I wasn't aware that all of the victims from the Malo massacre were from this town. 
because it's called Malo. Malo is another town 40 minutes away. But they were all from one high school in Fat, a Tunisian Jewish population of kids, 14 to 17, who had all gone on a school outing and been kidnapped by terrorists in another school where they were sleeping overnight in Malot, another town. That was in 1974, okay? Now, I started helping one of them around 2010 or so in Fox, and I uncovered this whole world of all these victims from a traditional tribal to in Jewish culture, many of whom never got treatment. It was a whole story of how it affected the whole town. It really affected the town dramatically. I won't go into that on this tape, but um, all of the leaders of the town today, which is now 50, you know, almost 50 years, uh, well, 74, 84, 94, uh, 45 years later, are all products of this massacre. They are, um, we're talking about the political structure, the business structure, the social structure, and most of the people that survived became caretakers either kindergarten teachers or school teachers or sociologists or psychologists interested. And I could talk about them more. I won't now. But um, there were 22 kids killed. There were, I think, 69 others injured out of over 100. And it was a horrific, horrific terror attack. Unbelievable. So I really significantly helped somebody. And then I turned out that the mayor, first of all, the, the former mayor had been a hero, him and his brother. And uh, they became part of my project. The current mayor uh, was named after his aunt who was murdered in the massacre. And the lady that I helped, who was a high official in the education ministry, was best friends with the aunt that had been murdered of the mayor. So she got attention to the mayor, and the mayor wrote me two letters and designated me a public office. He said, I have never seen anybody make progress with these traumas. Most of the people weren't treated, but the ones that were treated were treated, and nothing helped them. You have made major progress with them using these tools. Fine. I have empty buildings behind the police station that were former army buildings. I'm ready within the next several years to make them over into a new structure and make the largest trauma center in the north built on your work. Fine. So in the interim, I did this project taking quite a number of these people from this massacre, 38 years later, as well as a couple of Holocaust survivors, old people who had survived the Holocaust that lived in the same town. And we had unbelievable results. We still have films of that, nine days of films from a very significant producer. But um, then, to make a long story short, on the day I finished the project, in March 2012, I moved to Jerusalem, to the old city, and as I said, I started teaching educators here, but I also did something else. I had a relatively large budget in my nonprofit in 2014 because of supporters of my work, because it works, and I got one of the best trauma advisors in Israel, a person who had been entrusted by the Jewish Federation to a lot, millions of dollars for trauma work. He made a partnership between me and one of the primary significant PTSD mental health system clinics in Israel. In Jerusalem, it's a link to the Herzog Hospital. It's called the Maytop Clinic of Dr. Danny Brom, who is a PTSD expert. And for two years, we partnered. I sat in his office, and I trained his therapist. I brought Carl Dawson to Israel. I brought Ted Wilmont to Israel. Ted Wilmont is Carl's best friend, but Ted has probably more experience with Matrix than anybody else in the world. He's a very good guy also and a good friend of mine. So I brought both of them to Israel. Uh, earlier, I told you I brought Alina and Karen here for the project. Uh -huh. And... We tried to convey to them EFT and, and Matrix for the purpose of doing a proper PTSD uh, study with victims. We want the traditional mental health system in Israel to give it out to the people because six-year-old kids can use it. We believe in it. We know it works. And you know what? You don't need to believe, and this is a very important point for your audience, you don't need to believe that EFT works for it to work. 
However, to continue practicing it, you need to continue to see results. And if you don't believe it, you will nullify some of your results and you will not be able to give it to somebody else in a way that they will keep using it effectively. So I'm not saying you need to believe in it. I'm saying you need to prove it to yourself. And then, not because of your doubt, stop or go back on what you already proved to yourself, which is the problem with psychologists. They're always going to try and tell you it's because of the words you said. And that's why. So what did I do? I went to Roger Callahan's work. The predecessor of EFT is TFT, thought field therapy. It's all mathematical algorithms. Doesn't matter what you say. It's all tapping. So I learned the top levels of TFT from Roger's wife, Joanne, became uh -huh. licensed on the top level and brought their top trainers to Israel, which was Suzanne Connolly from Arizona and, and uh, Phyllis and Dr. Um, uh, oh, with, a, with an R from England. He's a, he's a proper uh, children's doctor. And they had done all the work with the Rwandan massacres, the genocide in the 90s in Rwanda. They've been to Rwanda like 10 times on all these scientific studies using just the algorithms of TFT, the only thing that works, right? For those kind of clear genocidal tribes. So I brought them to Israel. And then for two years, Suzanne and I, with Skype, I was sitting in Jerusalem with these therapists, and Suzanne was on Skype. We trained them here, and then on Skype, we met regularly, and we supervised them through their entire study where they treated properly classified PTSD victims, and it was successful, but it didn't change nothing. The reason I went to TFT was because they couldn't go back and say it's because of what you said. It's only algorithms. But they are just interested in supporting themselves to do studies. They're not really interested in changing the bureaucracy or the politics of the system and giving the public what works best. So it was, in my opinion, a waste of, uh, of, you know, of good funding because we, who know these tools best, can do the most good. Not because we believe in it, but because we proved it and we're living it, we're doing it. So we can give it over in a way that other people can get it, practice it, and change their lives. But again, I reemphasize, if I'm going to train people in Russia, it's only worth it to be if we set up from the beginning a relationship where people are going to commit to support and swapping. Because if you don't follow through, you will stop. I was told that 10 years ago there was an effort made with EFT in Russia, and it did not continue. Why? I can tell you. All over the world, first of all, EFT has to move to matrix because EFT is a basic tool, but it has some severe limitations. Having said that, it's great to learn it. You have to learn it. It'll change your life. It'll be the most basic tool kit tool, first aid for everything you want to do, and you'll be able to change your life. You'll be able to deal with craving, with pain, with mental and emotional stuff. However, you have to go on the matrix, and the main thing is you have to integrate it into your daily life like a personal eating procedure. You have to start to aggressively challenge yourself to make yourself the best human being you can possibly be. Other than that, I could tell you some amazing stories of people. Uh, yes, could, heard... could you just to, to the end of our interview, could you just tell a few uh, amazing stories about, I would say, soft cases, just about money, just about relationships with people, uh, maybe about some love relationships, marriage okay. and so on? I think the first thing to talk about is rape. I have dealt with rape with just EFT and had some amazing results. And that's why I wanted to tell a rape story first because rape doesn't just mean a woman being raped. It could be any male that suffers physical violence where he is overpowered because someone has a gun or is better at being violent than he is. The essential idea of rape 
is somebody forced you into something that was very sudden, violent, or usurping your control in a way that uh, really um, degraded you and made you have to come to terms with, you know what, I'm a human being, I'm not a piece of flesh, or I'm not just a, a cat of money, or whatever it is that they want from me, right? So, what I have found in dealing with race is a very basic discovery that is mind-blowing, simple, but mind-blowing and worse. And that is every case of rape I have ever dealt with, in exploring the issue with EFT, which is what I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you how to open an issue and elicit from the client what is really bothering them because they don't know. People think they know what the main issue is or what's bothering them. They don't. There are traditional male and female errors. I can tell you what those are. The male error is that we don't like to be specific. And EFT, you have to have a movie. You have to have a very specific event. It's not, well, every time my wife starts yelling at me. It's not, well, every time this happens. It's, you know, 2 p.m. on January 4th, uh, like a woman's memory. You were wearing a blue shirt. You were by the door when you called me stupid on Wednesday. And, you know, a woman will remember all those details. A man won't. He'll lump everything together and he will be vague because that's his way of distracting. What we typically do is we run away, distract, or deny. And that's why we get stuck and we don't advance in any issue that we have. We run away, distract, or deny. None of those things work. In other words, on two ends of the spectrum, if I deny there's a problem, I'm like the dog doll in the back of the taxi with the head bobbing, but I'm not really saying anything. I'm denial. Denial is not, you can't treat denial because there's nothing to treat. The other aspect of, the other side of the fence is identification. In other words, I am the problem. I am an addict. I am an LSD. I am an, an uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm an ADD, I'm a depressed, I'm a this, I'm a that. If I am the problem, so I can't change. I'm stuck. Or if I deny there's a problem, I have nothing to treat. In the middle is where therapy lies. Even though I have this problem, I deeply and completely love myself. That's what the discovery statement does. It knocks out the extreme end so that you have a realm where you can move. That is the proper definition and explanation of why the discovery statement of EFT works. It's not a content thing, it's a form thing. When I say, even though I have this problem, I am not denying I have something to work on, I'm being specific. When I say, I am, I am still okay, I am good, I am whatever, I'm saying I'm not the problem. My identity is not what's troubling or stuck sticking. So in race, as I was saying, or any physical violence, what happens is, is a bit of a myth, a lie. And that is that on the surface, a person thinks that the worst aspect is actually the physical violence. And many of the triggers are from the physical violence. For instance, if a woman was, uh, was hearing music in the background when she was raped, if she hears that music again, it will trigger the whole experience. And you will have to deal with that aspect of the problem, another EFT term, aspect of the problem. You'll have to nullify that, okay? However, the worst aspect, the one thing that if you knock out will completely nullify her rape trauma and all the other pieces will domino, fall out, and everything will be okay after a little while more work is the false guilt. There's inevitably, the worst aspect of a rape trauma is that women's intuition, I didn't tell you what the main problem of women is. I'll go back to that. I think men have that problem of being vague. They don't get the story. Women's problem is they look, they lump all the emotions in one. I'm frustrated, angry, depressed, whatever. You have to be working with specifics. It, you may have all of them. You may have a seven on this, an eight on that, a five on that. But unless you deal with one at a time, deal with the anger first because that's a ten. Or, or if you're not ready, deal with the age, which is frustration. But you can't put them all together. Women tend to, not, to lump their emotions together. Men tend to be vague to escape or deny or run away from the problem. You have to be specific when you make that sentence. And you have to single out a specific emotion. 
Those are the lopsided. So a woman, the work, uh, not just a woman, even a man from the violence also, the worst aspect of rape is false guilt. And that is that a woman's intuition tells her, you know what? I'm guilty. Why? Because uh, I felt that this person was dangerous. And it's my fault because I knew that and I could have prevented myself from being raped by that person because I should have known that. Now, that's almost always false. Because usually, unless she was very drunk or something, you know, usually that landed reality, felt reality, and that's a very important word, felt reality, because EFT only works with felt reality. That's the point of disruption in the energy system. We work, that's the meat and butter, bread and butter of our business. Go to the felt reality and make order there. Make it calm. Make it restore control. So the felt reality of the woman is, is it's my fault because I knew that person was dangerous. I could have prevented it. But it landed when it was already too late. Because usually when a woman is actually raped, unless it's a, you know, a very unusual circumstance, if it's, uh, and it could be unusual circumstances, it could be, you know, something on the street. But normally she has some relationship with the person and she misjudged who the person was. In those situations, at least, um, in those situations, at least, she probably couldn't have prevented it because it only landed that this person is really dangerous when it was already too late. So if you dispel that false guilt, then the physical violence is stinch because anybody can be overpowered by any, anybody else who's a, a bad person who wants to hurt them, right? So, um, you know, it's not a very pleasant thing, but you can deal with it. So, um, uh, in relationship therapy, I've had a lot of miracles, but I'll just say the principle of relationship therapy. We will study this all. You know, we just, on this interview, I need just stories, like stories. Okay, so let's give a story. <laughs> to, okay. I'm going to give you a story of a terror victim, first of all. It, um, he's a terror victim who happens to be a neighbor of mine also. He had a horrific terror attack where him and his wife were coming back from a child, uh, a child of theirs. And they were, uh, their car was ambushed by two machine gun terrorists from both sides of the road. And many, many bullets were shot in their car. It was the middle of the night, and they were in a place that was secluded, right? So they had to wait until security forces found them and took them to the hospital. Now, there were many miracles that happened, one of which was that a, uh, a bullet hit a coin, that if the coin hadn't been there, the woman would have been killed. As it was, she was minor wounded. However, her husband, was uh, was supposed to lose was supposed to lose a leg they thought and he did lose a finger and for a while his life was in jeopardy too I went to visit him in the hospital and I worked with him and then I found out that he was about to have a very serious operation where the doctors didn't give too much hope that he would walk again so in order to do matrix with him I probed his past. And on his timeline, he had that he had been at the age of 17. Now he's uh, within his 60s. At the age of 17, he had been a very, very good short distance runner. He had placed third in a international conference uh, con contest. And he remembers very well um, where he, like, you know, a spurt of drive to pass other runners. Okay. So what we did was we did a matrix intervention where our purpose was to reteach the neurology of his leg to work because it wasn't working. And we used his early experience of passing runners and placing, I think he won that race actually, to kind of implant that in his psyche. And a couple of days later, when the operation went down, it was a success that the doctors could not explain. Now, he's a neighbor of mine. I can point to where he lives, right there. <laughs> God, and, could you, uh, you're just in Israel. Could you show us the picture? Uh, uh, well, let's see what we can do here. Yes. Um, here's I my just, window. And it, yeah. it looks out over the Golden Dome, the Temple Mount. And the person that I'm talking about lives over there, if you can see that. Uh, now, I, can't, I can't show you what I want to show you, but I'll tell you. Okay, okay. 
Okay, this is a man. This is a man who today is close to the seven, right? Now, he has his house built in a way that he has from the top floor of his house. He has steps made of metal that are spiraling up. That most young people would hesitate if they have any fear of heights to go up those steps at all. Because you're going up a narrow step high in the sky and you see below you between the cracks and everything, you know. So this guy, in the last years since the operation, he walks with absolutely zero sign of any damage to the leg. And I see him now going up these steps to his highest roof with no problem. Do I understand you right? Like he already complete all his op surgeries, operations, and doctor yes. after that had no hope that he will walk. They didn't think he would walk again, and they even ah. they even were not sure he would save the leg. And now his leg is normal. Okay, I'll tell you another story like that because I think pain and injury stories are very powerful because physical pain is something that you can't deny, and that many things just don't work with them. But I want to emphasize that there's a tremendous emotional, spiritual component to physical pain. Just like in our goals, if we believe in something and we're congruent and we work toward it, we can produce it. Many times, medical limitations that say you're not going to get well or you're not going to do this again, if we are congruent and we work and we use these tools, we may find we have a totally different result. And I have another story about that using only EFT. I had a very high profile woman in her 40 who is like a very educated, put together lady. And she's married to a high profile doctor too. She's an old student of mine. And on my EFT training, I used her as one of the demos. We have demonstrations in the course because that's how people learn. So we did a trauma from her when she was 10 years old, and she had some thyroid issue, and they had to give her a general anesthetic to do a surgery on her. And as a 10-year-old, she was terrified when she was going under the anesthetic that she might not come out or survive the surgery and she might die. This created a PTSD trauma in her that um, had implications throughout her whole life, and believe me, very high-profile, glamorous, beautiful, put-together lady, married to a wealthy doctor. Everything's going good for her. She has great kids. Nothing wrong in her life. But it impacts on her life in certain ways because we're all human beings. And she has this trauma. So one day, she calls me on her cellular phone. She says, Rabbi Legomsky, because she calls me Rabbi. She says, Rabbi Legomsky, I am sitting by one of the busiest intersections in all of Jerusalem, with major big buildings, and I just had a car accident where my car was hit by a, um, a minibus, a much larger vehicle, also driven by a, by a Muslim, which in this country is significant, especially in a car accident, right? Because who knows where it can go, because there's so much tension different uh, people in this country, right? So, and there's often screaming and yelling when people have a car accident because people, especially if you drive a minibus, you're working for a company, so you're afraid you're going to lose your job, right? So she's sitting by the side of the road waiting for an ambulance to pick her up because they definitely won't let her go without checking her out at the hospital, right? So she's afraid. So first I question her, well, how do you know something's wrong? And she says, I'm very afraid that maybe my bone is going to break or it's broken in my back and it's going to lead to other problems, whatever. So this was years after the training, at least three years or so. But a light went off in my head because I have a certain intuitive gift that I remember the client's issues when I talk to them on the phone or they come in the room. Even if it's years earlier, I hope I still have that memory, but I've had that memory throughout my career. So a light went off my head saying, 10-year-old trauma, she's going into surgery, and she's terrified something's going to go wrong. She's not going to come out of it, right? So I didn't even tell her 
but I got her to access that on the cellular phone. We were working on a cellular phone at the scene of an accident. And what I did was got her to access the different parts of her body and release the tension in her body. Now she got to the hospital. Nothing was wrong. She later went on a promo movie for me telling the audience how amazing result, how she had such fear. And even on the promo film, she didn't remember that I had accessed and linked the earlier trauma from the anesthetic before the operation. But that's how I worked with her, and that's how I got her to release it. And then I went into the body, released the stress of the body. Now, my belief is, is that if we had not done that intervention, and believe me, another aspect of it is, is that who did she call when she was there? She trusted me. She was in a position of helplessness and fear, and she knew that this tool works and this guy is reliable, so she called me. So that's the job of a clinician, to understand the confidence of the person is in you, but your job is not to be an egotist. Your job is to enable that person to assume their stature and to heal themselves or prevent damage. So what happened to her was, I believe, that she could have had broken bones. Why? Because there's a phenomena in medicine that if you have severe fear or worry, you can actually cause brittleness in the bone, or you can cause damage to happen. Whereas if you know how to reduce the cortisol in the blood, in the blood by 24% and calm down, so the bones and the tissues become malleable and relaxed, and what might have become really serious, even irreversible damage, never happened. I believe that happened, and I believe she acknowledged that when she went on film to say it. However, it's interesting for us to know that she didn't even remember that the key part of the intervention was linking and accessing her 10-year-old trauma going into the operating room. Because what it tells us is, is that it's sometimes not important for the client to know why or what happened. But it's always important to self-empower the client to assume their confidence and their ability to interact with their own system and regain control. So I think that's a beautiful story because it also only used EFT and it was a cellular phone intervention. Okay, that's one more story. Let's see what else I can tell you. Um, I can tell you either the story of an extremely serious terror attack and his wife and also how it affects the relationship, or I can tell you a story about um, the original lady in spot. Oh, no, not the original lady. I'll tell you about the school teacher at the same school who um, who had the trauma uh, that I think I, I told you on an earlier. Time. Yes, yes, Joseph. I just we just need to finish our interview, but address to Russians like. Uh, okay, what do you know about Russians, Russians' issues? Uh, I, in Israel, there are many Russians, so you know the issues well, I think, and uh, our like mentality. And how do you see, like, what can you help, uh, especially to our culture, to our mentality? Okay. So, first of all, let me say that I respect the Russians today more than the Americans, and I was born in America. The reason being is simply because uh, the Russians still place a great value on intellectual uh, development, thinking, working, uh, a work ethic, and there is a seriousness and attention to facts that allows you to take these tools and excel in them and use them. And I think the Americans are lacking to a certain degree. Uh, consistency is a problem in every culture today. But if you can be consistent with them, I think you will by far excel the Americans in this tool. Um, that's my opinion. Um, and it's because of that essential difference. Now, everybody that I see in the world is emotionally immature today. And it's also true that at least on the surface, like Israelis also, Russians give the appearance of being a bit emotionally cold or out of touch with their emotions sometimes. 
and again, I'm being I'm, I'm superficial because I'm stereotyping, and you cannot stereotype a whole culture, especially a huge country like Russia. Okay. However, what I would challenge you is to use these tools to really aggressively develop in your lives your emotional sensitivity, your ad admitting to your emotions, and your desire to develop your emotional sensitivity, as well as your deeply spiritual bent, because I do believe that Russians have a spiritual component that, again, Americans, many of them are lacking today, okay? So I don't want to keep comparing cultures. It's not, it's not useful. But I do want to say that that's what I would say. Your intellectuality allows you to take this tool, learn it well quickly, and Pay attention to the quantifiable and qualitative differences in your life to prove it to yourself. And therefore, once you prove it, you can develop consistency of usage. That's the first thing. Because if you don't use it, it won't help. Okay? The second thing is to take it to the emotional and the spiritual sphere and start challenging the boundaries. Start letting yourself feel and acknowledge your feelings and bring it more into your realm of primary importance in your life because it will improve your quality of life. That's all. Now, in terms of other things, I will say that it has great applications to business people. It has great applications to relationships. But the bottom line is uh, the idea that it has a great potential to develop in your internal life, the ability to see uh, give and take relationships in a way that you're not paranoid so you're more successful. I wanted to see one example of that and then I'm done. Um, I once did a fundraising course. I learned it. And there's a philosophy of matching needs. And that is Let's say I walk into a wealthy man, which, by the way, that's another area which we can talk about. There should be a whole realm of therapy for extremely wealthy people because they face severe challenges today. The same challenges famous people face, but even more so because they, they don't know who to trust anymore because people see them as for their money, and that's really hard to be wealthy for them. So I've developed ways of working with that too. But the basic idea is let's say you go into a very wealthy person to make a business deal or to get a donation or in some way to work to try and reach your goal through that wealthy person. So there are two ways of looking at it. If you really have a belief system that's confident, that says, I'm doing something good, I deserve to get this done. And if I get this done, it'll be good for not just me, but for other people in the world. So you don't see that each person you go into has to be the one to fulfill your need. Because that's a very limited approach in the world. The world is full of good. The world is full of resources. The world is full of money. The world is full of everything you need. But your proper approach to fundraising should be, you know what? I just need to put out my congruent message and energy and I will gather the trust around me that I will be connected to the right people, that the right person that should merit to support what I want to do and be my partner will become my partner. So that's a different approach. What it means is you go into the wealthy guy and you say, you know what? This may not be the thing he likes to give to or likes to support in business. Maybe it's not his thing. Maybe I'm at the wrong address. But you know what? I'm going to share with him and take his advice. Because he knows something about getting things done and making money and resources. So I'm going to go into him and share, you know what? I got this great idea. I've worked it out. Why don't you tell me where my business plan is not correct or where I haven't seen something I need to see and help me make the plan better? And you know what? Maybe you're the guy who partner with me. Maybe you're not. But if I share with you on that level, and I've got something good, and I even allow you to help me make it better, you're going to trust me. And even if you're not the right guy, 
If you're a very wealthy man, you're connected to 10 other wealthy people. You will know the right guy and you will connect me to the right guy. That's a totally different approach. We have to be that way in every sphere of our life, whether it's women or business or anything we do, getting the needs met and respecting both or all parties that are involved in what we're doing. Back in 1987, okay, I remember having, with three generations of Russian women were my only guests. I had the grandmother, who was about 80. So if it was 87, that means she was born around the turn of the 19th century, uh, 18th, 20th century, 1900. Then we had her daughter, who was about 60, so who was born around the Bolshevik Revolution or a little after. And then we had the daughter, her daughter, the granddaughter, who was about 20, 25. Right. So we start telling the story of the Passover Seder, which is how the Jews were liberated from slavery in Egypt. Okay? So, midway through, it's a long evening, you know, about four or five hours, you know, whatever. And it's a whole story. And in the middle of the story, the, uh, the 20 year old girl starts asking questions. Like, you know, hey, I never knew nothing about my Jewish roots. And this is very interesting. And there's a whole culture here and a whole society, a whole story. And it talks about liberation and and problems and how to solve problems and whatever. So she starts asking questions. All of a sudden, you look at her mother, who's in her 50s, who lived right, you know, communist regime. She was like, Shh, no, what are, what are you talking about? What are you asking questions? She got all nervous. Like, you know, shut it up, be quiet. And then, all of a sudden, the grandmother started remembering all of her Jewish culture from before the Bolshevik Revolution. And she starts telling her granddaughter the answers. And obviously there were three totally non-religious people, right? But she remembers all these early childhood memories. And she starts telling the answers. And the mother in the middle, her daughter, is very nervous because she lived through a repressive regime that taught her you don't ask questions in any area that, um, you know, that, that question the balance of power or that talk about change or progress or, or uh, you know, removing limitations. So I thought it was a very interesting experience for me because I saw right in front of my eyes the history of a culture and how it impacted on people's ability to enjoy and respond to information and a cultural event. So what I would say is that, you know, it seems that that time has largely left in your country because, you know, things are not running the way they should be run. However, there's more freedom than ever before for people to become better people and for people to remove the limitations on their own lives. And that's the tools we're teaching. And that's what I think we have to focus on is uh, making trainings where the content of what people currently believe or feel or can argue about is secondary. And first is, you know, learn some formal tools that will make you be able to progress in any area of your life. You're stuck, make more money, have better relationships, um, deal with pain issues, you know, all the things that every human being needs and hopefully, hopefully become a better human being. And that will be the Last question, but it can be a very attractive question. Uh, uh, what about, do you have a story about money, like uh, tapping and money? You know, just... Yeah. Um, <laughs> tapping and money is a very simple story. Um, when a person, in fact, one of my colleagues that I work with is going through changes in business. And... Um, Whenever, there are different issues with money, but obviously one of the issues that's basic is to sense that every human being deserves to have enough to live in at least a manner that's dignified. So people that carry around deep sense of guilt or lack of self-esteem, um, have problems with deserving to make enough money. 
Then there's the other side of the spectrum, which is people that um, identify their identity with how much money they have, and they tend to be successful, but uh, not exactly happy, and often not exactly respectful of how they get their money or other people's needs. So these are two ends of the spectrum. I think both of them need modification. Could you uh, say a story, like uh, you, you're giving us content like answers, that will be more for training and for given results, but in interview, like the more, the stories, the right. stories okay. more so, valuable. So, um, which side of the spectrum would you like a story on? Uh, about someone who is poor, like we have a lot of poverty or thinking right. about that they can't, right. they can't do well with money. So okay. for those people, so, um, about those people. Yeah, I work with, I work with a number of people like that where I have, one story I want to kind of conceal who it might be, but um, the person had been successful at different points in their life, but uh, was going through a period of, you know, about two years or so of constant decline, making no money, uh, not getting out there. And it's particularly difficult when a person had been successful and now they're not. And um, of course, they don't want to accept a different role in life and do menial jobs or whatever. And sometimes that's necessary. But the question is how to get back to where you once belonged, as the Beatles said, right? So to get back to where you once belonged, uh, this person and I, we worked on, first of all, the, um, the, the sense of deservingness. The main intervention we used was matrix. Matrix. And the matrix... The main issues we did on Matrix were to go back on the timeline to places where they solved the issues of lack of deserving. Because uh, behind most of these issues is an inner feeling of undeserving. Just like, again, on the adult level, I'm not successful today in business or in coaching or in, or in making money. So how can I sell my services to help other people make money and be successful okay that problem solved i'm not successful in relationships how can i help other people with the relationship now it came to even i'm not successful in staying healthy because i'm drinking so most of the issues in matrix will go to the deeper level of when they got stuck on their timeline with undeserving and after that they had uh, like uh, he gained success and yes. Yes, they're now, they're, now, they're now getting clientele again. They're getting involved in relationships. A specific individual changed their life significantly in three ways. One, they solved the drinking problem and replaced it with exercise and healthy eating and loss of weight. Okay? Uh -huh. Second thing is they joined the right group to further their business interests and become and attract clients again. At the same time, those groups catered to their interest of forming um, love relationships without having to go again to a pathological approach, which is internet dating, which seems to be had been attracting um, people that would victimize the, victimize the person, which is often, you know, it's, it's easy to be victimized if you're working on the internet, you understand? It's harder to be in victimized if you're joining a group of people that have common interests, whether it's in church or business or, or you know, common interest hobbies, because it's a more naturally developing relationship out of uh, a group that shares a common interest, and it's easier to sort out who's phony and who's real. Okay, so it solves all three issues in the in the life of the person. But in order to get the basic issue. The basic issue was an inherent feeling of lack of self-esteem and lack of deserving to earn a living. So, and will you show uh, how to work with it for people, coaches, trainers, psychologists who will come? Yeah. To... In EFT, we will tell you how to work on aspects of the problem. When we get to Matrix, we'll talk about going into the underlying trauma and getting rid of the traumas that are coming up again and again, which are all giving you the same message, I don't deserve better. Yes. Uh, so... Well, I have to go. I've got kids I have to pick up. Yes, yes. Uh, 
thank you thank you very much for your time uh, we're waiting for you in moscow uh, and your training and what about certificates i'm working with carl now i'll have answers for you very soon but i'll let you know the answers very soon see you thank you very much for your time see you in moscow alive in a more uh, live event than just skype take what's useful what you think will help the people of russia but again we only want to help people gain food whatever works Get them on board in a significant way. Go for it. Yes. I have to go. Yes. All the best. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you.